who is a mother of three and practices family and sports medicine medicine on the traditional Coast Salish territor territories with a focus on youth over the past 20 years. She is a candidate of Doctors for Planetary Health, West Coast, and is an active member of various medical and environmental and peace community organization. She has a lifetime she has a lifelong appreciation of many nourishing and healing gifts of Mother Earth and works towards restoring health and peace for all. Also with us tonight is Kay Irani, is a psychiatrist and uh, psychotherapist in private practice. He has been a member of CAPE since 2021, involved in the various climate action events, interacting with the public to raise awareness on the impacts of climate change on health. He has a special interest in the mental health impacts of climate change. Kai's passion and concern for the environment dates back to his childhood for conservation, avoiding waste and excessive consumption along with reuse were promoted. So I will step down, I will hand this over and it's all yours. Great, thanks so much. And thanks everybody for coming out tonight. It's really a pleasure and honor for us to be able to um, speak with you and hopefully generate some dialogue and some solutions. This is a relatively new problem for us. Um, so we're always looking forward to working together and finding the solutions. So we'll be talking about health and safety in the climate crisis um, tonight then. And um, first of all, just want to acknowledge that we are here on the Coast Salish territories, specifically the territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh peoples. Um, First Nations people have been taking care of these lands for generations in a much better way than we have, and we have a lot to learn from them. Um, we thank them for being stewards of these lands for centuries and stand in solidarity um, with the work of decolonization. Um, so the United Nations Environment Program has actually named this as a triple emergency. Three interrelated but distinct processes that are happening. Climate change, pollution of the air, water and soil, um, and loss of biodiversity. Um, and these are all contributing. Tonight we'll be focusing specifically on climate change. So. As you can see here, the climate has changed over the millennia, but there's a, an exponential increase in, um, in temperatures just in the very recent past. In the past where there have been these gradual variations, the ecosystems could adapt, but with this very rapid spike in temperature, which we haven't seen before, it's, there's much more difficulty for ecosystems to adapt. And this rapid global heating is what's leading to the, the changes in climate around the world. So apologies if this is all old stuff to you, but we thought we'd run through it just very briefly. Um, there's pretty clear consensus that global heating is caused by emissions from human activity, in particular uh, burning of fossil fuels, um, and these are causing a greenhouse effect, which is raising the Earth's temperature. These are expressed in the number of particles in the atmosphere that are contributing the, to the greenhouse effect in parts per million, but alternatively, they can also be expressed as tons or megatons, as is often the case, of CO2 equivalents. Um, some of these particles have larger or smaller uh, uh, greenhouse effects compared to carbon dioxide, um, and but this allows for a way to measure. And you can see over the years, despite all of these uh, conferences of parties trying to work towards decreasing this, the, the numbers just keep going up. Um, and these are Canada's emissions. They, ha they rose steadily for quite a while, has an, been a little bit more in a plateau phase over the last couple of decades, um, with a dip in 2020 there <laughs> that we can see. Our uh, uh, Paris Agreement targets are supposed to be 30% below the 2005 levels, which would be actually around 407, which is off this graph if I calculated it correctly. And this is where we are headed with the current measures that are in place. There are other areas of the world, the UK is doing much better than we are. Um, so we have a ways to go <laughs> with that. And the, the global heating is having impacts on our climate. These are the, some of the effects that we're seeing. Um, changes in the water cycles. We saw the, the deaths, the enormous deaths of 
tens of thousand people uh, uh, of animals that w um, happened with the flooding that we saw um, a couple of years, I guess a year and a half ago. Essentially the population of Canada that was displaced in Pakistan um, last year with the with the drought with the floods that they had forest fires um we were seeing hearing stories in work of people who couldn't go outside um kids who were, had to stay inside also because of the effects of the forest fires the air pollution related to that um drought um that's one of the contributing reasons to why food is uh, uh, increasing in price because uh, farmers are struggling with the drought, um, acidification of the waters, warming temperatures, this is affecting marine life. Um, we're seeing melting um, in the Arctic regions and the polar regions, melting of the ice there. People who live on houses built on permafrost are finding that their houses are shifting um, with the uh, rising sea levels there's much more erosion and there people are losing their homes when they are living near the sea as well and then the extreme uh, storms and that we've seen a little bit of as well the impacts on health um, as you can see there the climate impacts there and they have a few this is one way of trying to uh, build a frame in our mind. Medical and physical health is impacted, mental health is impacted, and community health. Um, and there are just a few ways, I won't go through all of the details there, but a few of the ways that we can see that uh, community health is impacted as well, um, especially with um, food um, insecurity and people being displaced by the, the food, the extreme weather events as well. Uh, so those will have impacts on the community. Here's another way of looking at some of the health impacts as well. The air pollution, we lose 15,000 people per year in Canada prematurely due to air pollution. Um, allergens and uh, pollens, um, we're seeing increases in that in our clinics. Um, with the floods, we can see the food and waterborne uh, uh, problems, um, temperature extremes. The heat dome was a good example of the heat, the health impacts um, that we saw. Um, wildfires with the smoke contributing to air pollution, and then mental health. This is something issue, and that Kai is going to talk a little bit more about. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> so, so moving to that, which is, so what are some of the impacts of climate change? I think we've already talked about. Linda mentioned species dying off, uh, extreme weather events. Uh, acidification of the oceans, spread of insect-borne diseases, disruption of infrastructure and transport transportation systems, drawing of coastal, uh, drowning of coastal and island communities, repetitive crop, crop failures, as you said, and, and the one I, I will focus on is the mental health impacts of, of climate change. Um, so this was a study that was con conducted across uh, 10 countries. It was a survey-based study done by a number of prominent researchers in the field. And they surveyed youth between the ages of 16 to 25. And um, what they found was that 59% were very or extremely worried about climate change. Um, over 45% said that they felt climate change was negatively impacting their uh, daily life functioning. Respondents were quite uh, unhappy with the government response. Um, and there were correlations indicated that climate anxiety and distress were significantly related to uh, the perceived ina ina inadequate government response. So along those lines, um, more recent Canadian study uh, found pretty much similar findings. This was all done in a thousand youth between 16 and 25. And as you can see, 70, 8% felt that um, it was affecting the mental health and the government response was inadequate. So with that, I want to touch on one of the authors of the previous study, which was the international study. Her name is Britt Ray, and she was um, she's born in Toronto, Canada, but she's a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford the, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, where she investigates the mental health consequences of ecological disruption. Um, 
Britt has written this book called Generation Dread, which I don't know if you've read, but it is an excellent, excellent personal story about her struggles and to have a child, uh, her decision making and and what and what eventually um, she came to with it along with her partner. She's also touched on things that um, we can do to build resilience and support each other through this crisis. Uh, with that, I want to talk a little bit about some new and old terminologies that are coming around thanks to climate change. So um, now we have something called pre-traumatic stress disorder. That is symptoms of trauma that have occurring before the trauma before trauma has even occurred. So one in four people have a direct experience of climate change related events met post traumatic stress disorder um, screening criteria. And that was a study that was done in Australia that showed that. Um, recently, the Oxford English Dictionary decided to add eco-anxiety as a term. And they describe it as um, strong negative emotions associated with climate change that seep into everyday life of those affected. Another new term that has come was coined by Glenn Albrecht in 2003 is an Australian um, I get, um, environmentalist, I want to say. Um, and what that means is describes a homesickness without leaving home, as, as opposed to nostalgia, which is the melancholia of homesickness experienced by individuals who are separated from their homes. This is the distress that people are suffering as they are feeling more and more disconnected from the home they knew, even though they're there. So. Um, solace. Solace solastalgia. Solastalgia. It's like solace and, and algos are the two origins of the word. Algos meaning pain. Yeah. Um, there are a couple of books I think are very useful in learning more about mental health impacts of climate change along with what we can do. One of them comes from the Climate Psychology Alliance, which has actually very useful information on their website. It's a downloadable PDF and it's free. So I would recommend anyone who's interested to find more and learn more about this. The other is a project that is uh, was started by 60 women who wrote essays and is published in this anthology called All We, All we Can Save. And in that, I remember reading at least two um, topics on uh, two essays on mental health. One was Under the Weather by Ash Sanders and the other one was The Adaptive Mind by Suzanne Moser. So I guess I, I will leave it at that for, for now, but I'll end by saying that eco-anxiety is not a mental illness. Um, what it is is a call to action. So anyone who tells you that, okay, you're anxious and you just need to go and see a psychiatrist, that's, that's, that's a problem. I mean, they, we need to do something about it. Um, the impacts of climate change on mental health is, of course, as Linda has said, that it taxes the mental health, the healthcare system. We are seeing more and more people in distress. People are feeling hopeless. Our mental health provider system is already overwhelmed, and we don't have enough uh, therapists. So we need to find other solutions. And in the discussions, I can get into some of the other solutions that are out there. So thank you, and I'll pass it back to Linda. Anxiety is considered a disorder when the anxiety is out of proportion to the threat. But eco-anxiety is considered an, an appropriate response because it's a very real threat. <laughs> so um, as you, I'm sure your group and the same in healthcare know, um, the, the concept of prevention is so much more important. Um, it's much less costlier to, in many, many ways, to not just financial, but to prevent rather than to try to respond to crises and to disasters. And uh, climate change is entirely preventable, um, but we do need to act now. And it's taking action that we'll have to, uh, that we try to prevent this. Um, when we look at what we need to do, it's essentially reducing our carbon footprint. This is primarily for climate change, and it, but it will impact those other, um, the biodiversity loss and the third one was the air, pol the air pollution. pollution. <laughs> 
um, all of that will be impacted. And here's Canada. This is just a sampling of some countries, but you can see where uh, some of our footprint is, um, the larger areas and some of these uh, sort of larger groupings. Um, and essentially, we need to reduce consumption, consumption of energy, consumption of goods to waste a lot less. Um, here is one framework to try and kind of conceptualize the kinds of things we can do because it seems like a massive problem. It is. And finding ways to take action can sometimes feel a little bit overwhelming. Um, but here's just a sampling of some of the things that you can do on an individual level, um, the micro level, reducing your individual footprint, on a little bit larger, the community level, which is may where you may be wanting to work more as well and then on the macro which is a little bit more systemic um, and that can be trying to influence policy change um, interacting with government to try to see whether there are changes that can be made and you might have lots of other good ideas to add to these lists there this is another way of sort of conceptualizing some of the main categories of what uh, behaviors i guess where we can make changes to and you can think of ways to save energy well that at the micro meso and macro levels way to ways to change or to impact public transport also at the micro macro and meso levels as well so each of these can sort of be you can think of them as um, on those different levels as well <clears throat> So the idea of reducing can feel kind of threatening to some people. They may feel a little bit challenged that we have to do with less, um, give up some of the things that we enjoy in life. But the trade-off is that there are health benefits to so many of these things. When we do uh, and implement more active transport, we are healthier. Often the healthier diets are the ones that are more plant-based. Um, so there are lots of ways that will help us to feel better physically and mentally. One of these other important things, I think, too, is that all of these changes can mean a, a new way of living. Um, a new technology will help us in providing some of these new, greener, less emitting uh, energy sources. But that in itself won't be enough. We really do have to have a change in mindset um, and a change in worldview. Um, and we can look to the indigenous people who have lived in harmony with nature for millennia. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, Albert Marshall is a, um, a Mi'kmaq elder who came up with this concept of two-eyed seeing, of taking the Western, traditional Western kind of view and the indigenous um, ways of seeing things and trying to look at the problems through both of these lenses and incorporating their wisdom um, into our ways of seeing things. This is the many of the indigenous people to have a completely different worldview in their traditional ways of seeing things. Um, they view their place in nature as being different, not as dominating and um, destroying as ours was, but recognizing how nature was the source of life, of the air, of our water and our food, and that we need to protect that, um, that they were an integral part of this whole system and not sort of at the top of it, they, that we need to be taking care of all of this to, um, to, uh, for our children and our grandchildren and our, our great-grandchildren. Dr. Shannon Waters of the Coast Salish Peoples um, writes that our ecosystems are, are our healthcare systems because they are the source, they are life support systems. Um, and man did not weave, weave the web of life, we are merely a strand in it. What we do to the web, we are doing to ourselves. As uh, Secretary General of the UN has said, we're on a suicidal path, paraphrasing. <laughs> Um, and this idea of interconnectedness with nature is a core belief of a lot of First Nations peoples. Um, and the research is showing that people who spend time in nature, who appreciate it, have gratitude for nature, will actually take better care as well. Um, and then one of the things that I think is would be important for this group as well as others to think about that you may already be aware is that climate change compounds the impacts of other events such as earthquakes. Um, and uh, when planning community resilience to kind of keep this in mind, how do you plan for a heat, to manage a heat dome or the atmospheric rivers or the wildfires after an earthquake or the other way around? What is the impact of an earthquake during a flood or in the middle of a heat dome? Or when there are wildfires and there are people being displaced as well. 
So how do you manage those? There, it's a compounding effect. And from a health perspective, um, these consequences of the changing climate are compounding health problems. So we're seeing wildfire smoke in people who have already have heart or lung disease, and it's just making things a lot worse. Um, and then this kind of combines two of these ideas. Um, the whole idea of reducing the, the greenhouse gases and fracking uh, LNG um, natural gas is methane. It has a, um, it's a very potent greenhouse gas. It has over 80 times the greenhouse effect of carbon dioxide. Um, and so it, it, and yet it is also being re uh, found to be responsible for some um, um, earthquakes too. And it looks like we have an earthquake specialist in the room who might be able to, <laughs> to talk a little bit more about that. So. For us at Cape, this is we have an ongoing campaign to try and reduce fracking um, because it would significantly reduce effects of climate, especially in Canada, where we do produce in BC um, a lot of uh, methane um, and um, also these risks associated with it. So that's the end of this part of our presentation. We are hoping to engage in discussion. I do have actually some slides also prepared on in terms of preparing in terms of health for uh, climate, um, extreme weather events, if that would be, if anybody would be interested in that as well, um, just sort of from the health perspective. Um, but other than that, we're happy to take any questions. <laughs> we'll have some slides first and then we'll do some questions. Oh, okay. So if you, yeah, if you would be interested. So um, protecting health during extreme weather events and the ones that I wrote, I did a little talk for some students at Cap University. <laughs> it's just a, a few minutes here, but preparing for extreme heat, uh, storms, floods, and then fires or smoke. So first of all, there's the general emergency preparedness, and you probably know about this even more than I do, but to make an emergency plan, um, having in place some of these things to plan for, for power outages, for communication meeting, on, and then having the emergency food and water and emergency kits. For extreme heat, um, they, these are some of the suggestions in terms of how to manage um, an extreme heat event there. Um, staying cool there are a variety of ways of of trying to stay cool um he, having uh whoops a daisy there uh, some of them will be here making sure wearing a clothing or hat if you're outside um drinking lots of water never leaving the children or pets um, and then uh, storing medications in a safe some medications do have a safe uh temperature range and just want to make sure that um, people who are on medications are not, uh, uh, what do you call it? Cool, dry places as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Usually that they're not exposing their medications, which will then become not as helpful. Um, when somebody does have, is having a, a, a heat injury is what we can call it. A coil, cold and moist packs, showers, sheets, anything uh, that will help um, evaporate and, and absorb the the heat from the body. Um, having Finding a cool room, this can be on the north side of a house or of a, a building, um, down in uh, parking spaces sometimes for some people as well. If there's a, a, not in the house or the building, then in a, a community space, libraries or community centers, and we did see some of these opening up also. Um, and then people who work in the heat, making sure they have lots of breaks, that they have food and drink, and that they have appropriate clothing for those. Here's a brief uh, slide on some of the signs of heat stroke, um, sweating, muscle cramps that can um, progress to um, decreased urine headaches. Some people will have even nausea and vomiting. Um, cold and clammy skin even can be a, a more advanced sign as well. And then it can become confused and um, worse <laughs> for that. Preparing for storms, um, prepare for water contamination. That can be one of the issues. Um, and there's some of the ways um, it would be to, uh, in the next slide, actually, I'll have some of the ways to store water, but you may all you know, be aware of this. And also um, having a water, water filtration 
you know system, the system with you if they're if that's available to preparing for power outages being pr or prepared to shelter in place as well and having a safe room or a warm room so this might be a room that's away from windows that could be shattered um and or having a, a warm room if it's in if it's w a winter storm and that might be one that's towards the middle of the uh, house or apartment or wherever you um, might be staying or that's closer not on the outside walls um, of the building either preparing for floods um, finding high ground or space there storing the water and these are some of the ways at the end there of finding water that may be clean um, to store to fill up the bathtub ahead of time or that kind of thing and then just a warning to never cross flood waters there are a surprising number of people who are injured and deceased from trying to cross flood waters when we don't know what's underneath. We might know what was there, but not currently. It can hide a lot of dangers. Um, and then fire and uh, smoke, staying inside, closing the doors and windows. Here again, it's the idea of having one room that you may be able to put, some people can't filter all of the air and they don't have the means or they don't have the financial means to buy a filter having one designated clean room where they may be able to provide a filter there um, and to stay hunker down in that room a little bit too with the air a filter or purifier and then using masks as needed so that's a very brief run through <laughs> um, and that's it so any questions and uh, we may be learning from you too. <laughs> I need to steal one of these. Okay. Great. All right. Uh, thank you so far. And uh, we'll take questions from the room first, and then we'll take some uh, questions from those in the web audience. So, questions from the room? Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm very interested in the impact of um, uh, disasters on mental health. Do, do you see uh, in examples people besides getting very depressed, do they actually start to act irrationally? Yeah, thanks. You thank you. That's a that's a good question. I, let me ask you, what do you mean by irrationally? He's talking about you. <laughs> I guess. Um, it could take different forms from people being very anxious um, to getting over controlling to um, to giving up hope i mean but that would be on the depressive side of things again feeling hopeless um, people taking drastic making drastic changes in their lives because they don't know how to deal with that within uh, their family or the, their their relationships you know, leaving relationships, you know, breakups, things like that can happen, yeah. Depending on the intensity, no. uh, depending on the intensity of the event, uh, even people do become psychotic sometimes, some people. Uh, absolutely, I mean, it depends on what your predisposition is and what your baseline level of your mental health is, right? If you are, likely to have or have had previous psychotic episodes it's high highly stressful events can precipitate another psychotic episode just to um add to that i had a point that i was thinking of is that we're seeing i am also i work with youth um and see how for some of them um climate anxiety impacts their functioning that it it hijacks their brain to a certain extent and it's hard for them to study because they're thinking about these other things we see also impacts on decision making in younger people who are not seeing the point of saving for retirement because they don't see a retirement uh, for themselves not wanting to have kids some of them not wanting to pursue studies their post-secondary studies because they don't see the point so this could be hopelessness whether it's mental health there too but it's having an impact on on some youth on the kinds of decisions that they're making um, and then the other thing too just with the pre-traumatic stress disorder with social media these days people are able to see what's going on on the ground in all kinds of these disasters um, and with this crisis that is an impending 
emergency, they're seeing what's happened in other, uh, in other communities and this makes them worry about that this will, especially when they're able to see what's happening um, in real time to others. And maybe Kai wants to say more. <laughs> yeah, so to, to add to that in terms of uh, both pre and post traumatic stress, you can, with social media being so easily available, you can be exposed to trauma that's happening miles away and, and experience symptoms of trauma based on that. Or you can start envisioning what your world would be or what traumatic event might happen. And that could make you hypervigilant, have nightmares, flashbacks in the day, that kind of thing. So, uh, My question is about how you would deal with uh, what seem to be inappropriate responses to climate change issues. Like, And uh, uh, the example I'm thinking of that you see in neighborhoods and, uh, and sort of community levels are uh, you know, people have trouble growing their lawns, and so because it's dry, et cetera, th climate issues with that. And uh, they have problems with sports fields. And so what they do is replace the, uh, the grass with a synthetic turf, which actually is worse in terms of the problem that we're trying to deal with. It generates more heat and uh, it's, uh, you know, bad generally for the environment with the microplastics and that kind of thing. So how do you address sort of what look like really inappropriate behaviors for a problem that has other solutions? Do you want to go, should I? Go ahead. I, have, I, have my I think, I, I think that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, uh, I think it begins with something that we're doing here is, is having community. If you, if you have a sense of ability to connect and communicate and and, and share, share things as a community, then you will be able to have these difficult discussions with them. Sometimes, as you said, people are well-meaning or ill-informed and their, their idea is, okay, I'm not going to water the ground or I'm not going to burn uh, you know, gas by mowing the grass every time and I'm going to replace it with artificial turf. But just as you said, there are even more harmful effects of that. So it's just sometimes it's about how introducing uh, something to your neighbor or your stranger or, or someone you know in a way that um, that would make make them hear what you have to say. So along those lines, there's a there's another book called um, what's it? I'm right and you're an idiot or something like that. I can't remember the name of the book. Um, I will I will remember it. Uh, it talks about how to engage in these uh, in these conversations with people who might be on. This is strangers who might be actually on the other end of the spectrum, but here it might be just someone who's ill-informed, but there, there are ways in which you can find common ground. As soon as you start finding common ground, you can kind of start helping people move. And the way is to empathize, to try and understand where they're coming from. That would help open up the discussion. <laughs> they're, they're, they're a different breed. <laughs> yeah. And interestingly, when we speak with politicians, they say we can't make any policy changes until the people want it. So we need to hear from people, which is also part of this sort of trying to make our voice heard. I think one of the points there too, though, is this, um, that sort of brings up this need for a change in mindset, that we need to live in harmony with nature and not dominate it as we have been trying to do for so long. Um, so that's part of that change. And that will, I think, happen through having these community forums and trying to share our ways of a different approach and um, trying to um, reconcile and build on what this the the wealth of knowledge that the traditional in, indigenous um, ways of of knowing and their wisdoms they have a lot to teach us <laughs> hey anybody else other in the questions room? questions i was just thinking about the, the lawn thing um one of the things that's happened on our particular block is you know one person starts making a boulevard garden and digging up their lawn and putting flowers and and it sort of spreads because people don't like the lawn to mow their lawns anyway and the crows are digging them up anyway and you know and you can't water them so uh, you know so that that's a way you, a change happens kind of gradually too without when they're actually vegetables yeah, some yeah. of them are a bit, yeah, some of them are a bit. So leading by example. Yeah, yeah. 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 well, yeah. that's without saying you're an idiot, you know. Yeah. <laughs> With those leaf blowers. 
But I mean, there is some change because they're banning those things. Yeah. Looking around the room here, I suspect some people have grandchildren. I have an eight year old, pretty bright little boy, and I'm really starting to fear when he's going to ask grandpa, how bad is climate change and what's going to happen? And I'm trying to, and I'm a scientist, I'm an environmental scientist, I've retired, but uh, I'm keep on coming up with scenarios of how I'm going to describe what's happening and what might happen to him and what might happen to his children. Any advice? <laughs> if you want to go. You go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, that is that is something we're going to have to talk more and more about. And and the suggestion is to to be honest. Uh to be honest, to keep it simple, um, but also to tie in with some hope that that there are things we can do. Um we don't know what the future is going to be like. All we know is that it can get worse, and it will get worse if we don't do anything. That doesn't mean all is lost. It, it just means that we have an opportunity to, to affect the future. And at every stage, whatever we do affects that future. And so it's, it's encouraging him to kind of, you know, to start thinking about this. It's, it's early for him, but, you know. At eight, you never know. I mean, he might have a project in school where he talks about recycling or, or some other climate action that he's taken. So, one of the values of those difficult emotions is that it is a potential um, source of energy to uh, uh, become action. So, when the kids are anxious and they're sad, you don't necessarily want to squash that. You want to be there to help them with it to help them sit with those feelings and then say, what can we do? These are real feelings, they're very valid, but then what can we do with that? And that can sometimes inspire change. And if you can brainstorm with them and say, what can we do around the house? What would you like to do in the community? And that can sometimes inspire action. P uh, people will often feel better about themselves um, that they're actually taking some action. Um, so that's another way to approach this, is to sit with the feelings, validate them, and then not wallow in them to the point of that incapacitating you, but then trying to move forward when they're ready on to what can we do with this anger or frustration or sadness. Linda makes a good point. I mean, that, that is something I should have also touched on. It's, it's the, the emotion is, is an opportunity to act. And it's about how how do we can help contain and channel, and that's where you can come in. Because we all, it's hard for them because I think they can hear me. Okay. Oh, it's hard for them because, well, my son's forty now, but when he was fourteen, taking out the compost was not as simple as dumping it in the green bin, and and it and it's a bit like all these riding your bike and taking the bus means you have to plan ahead and put the right clothes on and it's not as easy mm -hmm. and so they have to see us doing it they have to see us uh, change putting the garbage out and putting the green bin out and making the compost and recycling and uh, your kids inspire you. Oh, yeah, well, no, I mean, because I remember my son complaining bitterly. And finally, I said, well, put it in the garbage then. I, it's your world, you know. And that made him stop complaining, as a normal teenage boy would do about anything. But my response was, fine. You know, and he had no answer to that. And so it is harder mm -hmm. to ride your bike. and and be lit. well of course it's pretty awful driving your car now in vancouver so <laughs> so maybe that's a solution make driving your car horrible great <laughs> any more questions from the room and actually that's a good point actually to to um redesign our cities and our communities in ways that make these things easier that um packageless uh, groceries are much more available in grocery stores, that there are safe bike lanes um, all over the city, uh, those kinds of things. And those are the kinds of things that we can advocate for as community groups um, and that kind of thing too. Um, 
I guess reviewing all of this, um, I'm kind of a lot of the the points you made about people being uh, despondent potentially about the future, maybe being hedonistic because they don't see the point in saving for a retirement that likely will never come. Um, it occurred to me like a lot of this stuff could also be said uh, due to economic reasons. And it's that same rapacious economy that's causing most of this. Um, so maybe um, look why people decide to do the things they do in terms like that, but it's um, the types of jobs causing uh, one of the fallout effects is the uh, impact on the environment. Uh, I guess, yeah, uh, a lot of people would be very dis uh, not being able to retire because they can't afford to do it, even if the environment was in perfect shape. Um, so. I think um, when having these conversations and that goes to this, it's a, it's, it's a link. If you can find whatever would would touch that person would interest that person and you can find you can find something for almost anyone from the people who like to ski and the loss of their you know ability to ski or the people like wanting there's always a link and and the link can go back with climate change worsening i mean everything goes out from our insurance costs when we have disasters like this right and then to our food security and to our health healthcare system it, we can or any place where we can talk about these kind of things and that's an interesting argument too because there's often we don't have the money to uh whatever to make these infrastructure changes and that kind of thing but this there has costing done and it will be way greater than what we can imagine <laughs> so the prevention is one of those really important factors yeah on on that line on the costing and and the benefits of that there's another really good project called drawdown.org if you if you want to check that out and they have done a cost analysis of what each of these alternative forms of energies would cost and how much the investment would be required how much the savings would be and yeah it just it's it's a no-brainer we can easily shift and transition over right now be keeping up employment if not creating more employment in a lot of different sectors like wind and solar and yeah there has to be just the push to, for governments because currently the governments are being fed by big corporations so so we have to speak as a community to kind of let them know that this is what we want do we have any uh, questions? Uh, okay. If anybody has any questions uh, in the audience there, uh, just raise your hands or unmute. It's called Drawdown, D-R-A-W-D-O-W-N. Project Drawdown, if you Google that, and you will see they'll have, um, they have, what do you call, a web, a web series for introduction to, you know, climate change. And they also have, by each action, what are the benefits, what are the costs? They've done this on a global scale. It's a big, it's a big project. It came started out of a book called Drawdown by Paul Hawken yeah. um, of the US, and there's actually a more recent update in the last year or so. Uh, 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 re yeah, update on his book. It's a very mm -hmm. dry book. I think the the, yeah. the, web, the, the website the website is a is a lot more engaging in the video clips that you can go through and yeah and see it's it's it's. Okay, uh, and no questions from the internet audience. First of all, thank you so much for uh, giving this presentation. It's really appreciated that you're here with us. Uh, when um, you mentioned um, um, what are the earthquake-related stuff, uh, how should we be prepared and all that, 
Uh, I'm from Turkey originally, and you all know what happened. The big earthquake hit uh, Syria and um, Turkey. So, um, in terms of mental health, definitely, how far you are, it doesn't matter. Uh, the whole community here was really down. Um, the first month was like we lost our sleep. You know, it's everything like um, we couldn't sleep. We had to watch all those videos constantly. Everybody is worried. They couldn't get news from their families, friends. It was very, very devastating for the community. Um, definitely um, very close even if you're so far away <laughs> close by just you live with it for a while uh, the other thing which i wanted to touch on you were talking about what happens after the earthquake um, as a disaster uh, waterborne diseases all that uh, even two of the cities had flood afterwards it just happened <laughs> It was very bad. Uh, 10 cities were affected, about 15 million people. It's half of the population of Canada. Um, and knowing that this was not just the earthquake, but how those buildings were built without um, you know, proper code follow-up or some, some sort of... Uh, Anyway, I won't go that part too, <laughs> too much. But um, uh, people died under those collapsing buildings, and some of them were uh, old uh, with asbestos in them. And right now, when all that debris is being um, you know, carried with um, heavy machines and everything, a huge, huge smoke is coming from there. Uh, with asbestos and I don't know how this will affect this will have another layer in the coming like 15 years 20 years later that area will now that population affected will be dealing with another disaster basically so just wanted to mention that because it's not out there not much talked about but when an earthquake hits so bad and so many buildings are down and uh, many many people are exposed now so. Yeah, and, and along those lines, you can. this happened during winter, right, in, in yeah. the middle of winter. So you can imagine, I mean, we've, we've been having more and more winter storms in over the last couple of years. Imagine if we have one of these natural disasters that happens when our emergency vehicles can't get there, right? Or, and people trapped, let's say, under rubble, if there is a strong or like fluctuation and there is no fall and you know the ones who got out who survived after even seven days and ten days under the rubble they have even even a less chance of making it right like so there'll be even more lo loss of life in all these ways so loss of shelter and then you have these um extreme weather events on top of that i think that just is a compounding factor yeah <laughs> Carlos, I'm just wondering if you might want to add something uh, with your expertise. Not that I want to put you on the spot. Okay. All right, then. Uh, I want to thank you both for coming in. And it was much appreciated. And for those of you uh, that aren't here in person, just remember uh, next month, Carlos is doing a presentation for us. And hopefully we will see you then. So again, thank you everybody for attending. And thank you once again for coming in. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Uh, for those who are in Cape Broad in, if you'd like to take a look, take a look. Uh, and there's still some questions. If you have more questions, yeah, feel free. We're there. Well, this is the name of that book by Brickway. Oh, Generation Red. <laughs>